Let's start our class off with prayer. Father, we're so thankful for another Lord's Day you've given to us. We're thankful for the privilege that we have to come together in this capacity and to worship you. We, we're thankful for this period before our worship that we can study and we can learn those things that would help us to be the kinds of servants that you would want us to be. We're thankful, Father, this morning for everything you've given to us, those things that sustain us. But we're highly appreciative of the spiritual blessings that come through your Son. We pray, Father, that we'll always realize these blessings and to realize that if we walk according to your will that we'll be in the fellowship that we need to be in and we'll have these benefits to continue to come upon us. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to use these to, to grow, to uh, be, become more each and every day. Help us to evaluate ourselves in light of your word to see where we're falling down and where we can improve, continue to do those things that are needful in our lives. We're aware, Father, that we're human and we fall short of what you'd have us to do, but we realize that we have the avenue of forgiveness. If we repent of our sins, we know the blood of your Son will continue to cleanse us as we walk in the light. We're mindful this morning as we gather of many who are struggling, who might not be able to make it today, but we know that their hearts are to be here. We pray for those as they struggle with their health, and we pray that those who are administering to them, the doctors, nurses, might be able to bring their health back, that they can be back with us. We're mindful of many who have chosen not to be here today. And we pray, Father, that that thought process might be changed, that they might realize the importance of living their lives in accordance to your will. And something may be said or done that would cause them to change the way they think. We're mindful of those who've lost loved ones and know the, the pain and suffering that goes along with that. And we pray, Father, that as these difficult times will lean upon your strong hands and your compassionate heart and then you will help heal us and um, bring about the comfort that uh, only you can give. We're thankful for this congregation. We're thankful for uh, those who make it up. We pray that we'll always be an active body, that we'll be working to do those things that makes the body um, to grow and mature. We pray, Father, that you bless us in this location. Be with those around the world who are teaching the truth. And if there's some way possible, Father, please expose false teaching. Make people aware of it. Uh, open up their eyes. Give them the opportunity to know what the real truth is. We're thankful for this nation. We pray that you bless us, keep us free. We pray, Father, that you will help our leaders make the decisions that will lead us back to you and that we might, once again, institute in our schools and in our homes prayer and, and believe in God, belief in God and follow after those ways that are the ways of the Bible. Pray, Father, you continue to bless us in the days ahead and we'll watch over and care for us. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. In one passage that we looked at, John chapter 6, Jesus had told them that he was, number four, he was the what? He was the food. And he you know, used the terminology bread there and related it to the manna, which fell, uh, sort of tied it in so that something that they were familiar with, the manna which fell from heaven when they were 
uh, wandering in the wilderness after coming out of Egypt. He said he was the food or the bread and what? The drink, his blood. And he said, if you don't partake of my flesh and blood, you can't enter into the kingdom. And uh, obviously they, they ridiculed that and they questioned it in, in their minds and talked about it among themselves. But Jesus, he is that bread of life. He is um, what can sustain us. Now, obviously, we understand that people are born, they mature, they survive, but we're talking about things that are eternal. We're thinking, talking about things that are far beyond this physical body. And that's what Jesus came to be a part of, was our eternal salvation. And if you uh, try to think physically about what Jesus was talking about, it, it makes no sense. But if you dig deeper, you try to comprehend, then you come to an understanding of what Jesus is talking about. And isn't it interesting? Uh, I'm not saying that there was no process of thinking in the uh, Old Testament. But basically under the law of Moses, it was like, do this, do this, do this, don't do this. And so if the subject came up, well, what about eating um, something that's unclean? Well, no, that can't do that. Well, what about doing, doing this? Well, yeah, we can do that. And so they knew it just in, if, if you think about it, when we, we, we refer to it today as black and white, I mean, it was there. Under the, the law of Christ, there's some thinking that's involved in it. Uh, physically, they were provided for by God in the Old Testament. If they obeyed God, God protected them, God blessed them, God gave them the things that they needed. There were some spiritual things associated with that, things that were beyond what was normal, like the manna coming from heaven and the quail that was available for them. Now, if you've ever been around uh, quail, um, sometimes referred to as Bob White, how many of you just gone out and just grabbed one of them? I mean, if you were hunting, how many have you ever? Those things are quick and they're fast. And you can come across a, I guess what you call a covey of them. But you better, you better react quickly because they're gone. Well, could you imagine that? Just going out somehow and collecting the quail? Do they just sit sort of sitting there for you? So there are some spiritual things that happen in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the challenge is there. You've got to look beyond your normal physical realm. You've got to think in terms of spiritual, spiritual things. I'm the blood, and this is the blood and the body, and you partake of me. Strange, right? We, how do we partake of Christ? It just sounds weird. And, of course, them in their, the state that they're in with their blindness, and that was a part of the big problem with the the uh, religious leaders and the people that followed them in New Testament times was the blindness. They couldn't see beyond certain things. So Jesus comes and preaches things like this, and they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't make any sense. What do you mean, take of your body and, and your blood? That just sounds weird. So they had to look beyond that, had to understand that. Jesus said on occasion, my meat is to do what? The will of the Father that sent me. My meat. What does that mean? My sustenance. My sustenance. What sustains me is not the food that I eat. My meat, my sustenance is the meat of doing the Father's will. Now, how do you relate to that? How can you do something like that that doesn't take in any, anything into the body and that sustain you? Well, that, that's a different way of thinking than we maybe have thought about before. So we challenge as Christians today to think in those terms, to think in terms of being eternally with God and what it takes to do that. Uh, it's not like go down here and take a test. Oh, you passed the test, so you're good. 
It's, it's the challenge of living every day according to God's will and doing those things that are not things that you can reach out and grab hold of, like kindness and mercy and faith. How do you grab hold of those things? Those are things that are beyond the physical things in this world. So Jesus challenges them here. They can't handle it. And most of them said, that, that's enough of, of Jesus. We're just going to walk away. Because they couldn't comprehend it. So he's the food. He's the drink that keeps us alive. And we need to understand that. Number five. Either the Bible is understandable or what? God lied to us. I want you to follow my will. Jesus came to do the will of the Father, to present the will of the Father to mankind. Now, granted, I pick up some things sometimes, instructions, and I, I read them several times, and I still don't understand what people are trying to tell me to do, put something together. But has God told us anything that's not understandable? Now, we don't understand it because we choose not to understand it. I mean, if you were going to come up with some entrance criteria to some human organization, you would, you would map out some of the things that have to be, you have to be a uh, good character, you have to have, um, I don't know, let's just, just think of discussion, doesn't, doesn't matter, not trying to match up anything. You had to have at least a high school education. You had to have a driver's license. I mean, just some things like that. We could go down and check the box, right? Yeah. I, I'm pretty good standing. I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm not a criminal. I've got a driver's license. I've got a high school education. Check the boxes, okay? I should be able to enter that organization. Come along with the being part of the kingdom. You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. How many of you have seen Jesus? Do you know that he existed? How do you know he existed? Well, when I was back in school, the history books talked about Jesus as a character that existed and when he existed and when he lived upon this earth. I don't know if they even do that anymore. Probably take it out because they don't they want to talk about anything according right, this associated with God. But I, I've read that in, the, in my old history book. How do you know Jesus existed? And how do you know that God exists when no one's seen him? How do you deal with that? And how do you believe in somebody you haven't seen? Well, we could look at some examples. Do I believe that Hitler existed? I don't have any personal contact with Hitler. But people have talked about him. People have written books about him. He obviously existed because people have talked about him. But he was a human being. He was flesh and blood. Here's God. I want you to believe in God. I want you to believe that Jesus is his son. I want you to repent of your sins. Well, you know, we all make mistakes. There's none of us that are uh, mistakeless, if that's a word. But I want you to repent of that. What does that mean? I want you to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. And then I want you to be buried in the waters of baptism. It's just, we think about that and it seems a little strange, doesn't it? Water, yeah, I get in the water, I take a bath, take a shower, I go jump in the, the pool maybe, or I jump in the lake or something. I know what water is, I know what it means to get wet. You're asking me to go get wet. 
does the water have any power in it? This water back here, Johnny, I don't think we got this water in any special place, did we? We just turned on the faucet. That's just water, right? So when you start talking about the things that, about Jesus, there are things that go beyond the physical. We got to think beyond the physical. And, and that's just, that's just strange for us. And when you think about God, he has either given us the truth and we have to trust him and be obedient, or he's lied to us. Which one is it? Well, when someone lies to us, what eventually happens? That lie is exposed. You said this, and here's what happened. That what you said was not truthful. That was a lie. So where can we go? What can we point to and say that that's where God lied? That's where God lied to us. And don't you think people have been trying to do that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? That there's where God lied. There's where he told something that wasn't the truth. And we can't do it. Men have tried for centuries to say this is where God is wrong, but they can't do it. So we need to understand that God is truthful. And if he's truthful, then the Bible is something he's given to us to understand and to live by. And we need to live by it. We've talked about this over the last several weeks. The problem with what the Bible teaches is our acceptance of it. Because the Bible says, don't do this, don't live this way, don't be involved in this, come out of the world and be different. And that's where we have the problem. I have, I have hesitation there. My friends are like that. Or if I do this, then that con condemns in my mind my family members. There aren't hard questions. There are difficulties in our lives of dealing with the answers that God has given us in his word. Number six. The Bible is the source for all the right answers. And that's what we're just talking about. If I want to know how to deal with something or I want to know what God thinks about something, I can go to the scriptures and I can get an understanding. Now, he may not specifically mention the thing that I'm talking about subject matter-wise, but he lets us know in a general sense what he thinks about that or what cautions he's given us about that. And uh, we need to be astute enough to listen to what he has to say. There are the answers. We just have to go search out to try to find them. Number seven. Blanks Christians are responsible to know the Bible. We are responsible to know the Bible. You ever have a teacher tell you that uh, you're going to have a test? Let's say they tell you on Friday you're going to have one on Monday. Not a good time for kids. Friday they're already out, you know, it's like, yep, week's over with, I don't have to think about school. And then there's Monday, you know, the reality. You ever walked into a classroom and the teacher says, okay, we're having that test today, he starts handing out and you forgot about it? You didn't prepare for it? The panic that starts setting in. It's like, whoa. Whose responsibility was it to prepare for that test? Well, it was yours. And you learn over time not to make that mistake again, if you ever made it. But Christians, we don't come in here on a Sunday morning and say, okay, take out your pencils and a blank sheet of paper, and get ready to answer the following questions. 
We don't do that. But who's responsible to know the Bible if it's not Christians? Whose responsibility is it? We don't expect the world to know what the Bible teaches. God and, and Jesus Christ already know what the words are. Oh, the preacher. There we go. We found the answer to that question. The preacher is supposed to know the answer to all these questions. You don't get off the hook that easy. You have the responsibility to know what the scriptures teach. Do you have to have them memorized? No. Do you have to know everything about everything that's in the Bible? No. But you have to have an understanding of at least why you became a member of the body of Christ. Why did you do that? Because if you know those simple things, you can at least tell somebody that you come in contact with, here's what I did and here's why I did it. And of course, as we become Christians and mature, we're supposed to know more and more about the Bible. Paul says to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. Why did he tell him that? Well, you know, Timothy's going to be a preacher and he needs to know these things. No, we all need to know these things. We need to study God's word. We as Christians need to know if something's in the Bible or not in the Bible. We need to know tell, to be able to tell somebody what it takes for someone to become a child of God and why we need to do that. If it's just in a general sense, that's okay. You don't have to be able to say, well, here's this, and it's in this chapter and this verse. You don't necessarily have to do that. But you have to know. You have to grow. We don't become Christians that come in and sit down in a pew somewhere, and then we say, we're here, we've arrived. That's not a Christian. We've got to grow. We've got to know more. And to know more, we must open up God's Word and study it more. And just a tidbit of side information. If you have to teach a class, you will study. You can't go into a class and say, well, I'm here. Let's open up our Bibles. Anybody got a good place to open them up to? You got to have some preparation. So, if you want to push yourself a little bit, start teaching. And then you'll learn something. But that shouldn't be how we learn. We should be learning every day because we know what God's Word is telling us. Number eight, one cannot teach what he does not know. What I do not know. If I were to tell you that I'm going to teach you how to make some dish, you'd probably laugh at that anyway. But if I didn't know what the recipe was and I just sort of knew in general, that it may have some eggs in there and something, you, you know what it's going to turn out. That's going to be a disaster because I didn't know what the recipe was. I didn't know how to make something. Well, if we don't know what the Bible teaches, we've got to understand the responsibility of Christians. I've got to be able to tell people why at least I am a member of the body of Christ. If I can't answer that question, then that says I need to go back and study some more. You cannot teach what you do not know. Number nine. He says there are multitudes in the valley of decision and they desire biblical answers. I, I agree with that, but I also have problems with it. Let 
Because I think a lot of that has to do with where you are, what location, of the, where you live. I think if you go to most people on the street of Huntsville and you were to say, you're really wanting to know what God's word is, don't you? And I say, no, I already know. I'm a member down here at so-and-so. How many y'all have knocked doors? I want to see, I don't want to see hands. But you've knocked doors. I've knocked doors in this community. You go in and knock doors. Um, we're from the Maisel Church of Christ, just over here a few miles. I think you know where it is. Um, we're like, want to invite people to, to come to services, to come to a meeting, to study the Bible with us or whatever. You know what the, most of the answer is? We go down here so-and-so. And uh, we're, we're satisfied, we're good. We don't, we, don't, we, don't want, we don't have any need to talk to you. Most people in America, my, maybe in my opinion, but I think it statistically would be borne out, will say they're okay with where they are, they don't want to know anything more about where they are, they are not desiring to know God's will. But I think in a lot of the countries that we uh, we visit, we have missionaries in. I think there are a lot of people who are wanting to know what does the Bible say. So yes, I know there are a lot that want it. I'm not sure this country, for the majority, is interested in the Bible. We are becoming, fastly becoming, uh, a nation that is an ungodly nation. Because those people who have, if you, if you were to fill out some questionnaire and you say, are you a Christian? They'll check that box. But that's not what they really are. That's out of convenience. That's out of maybe church uh, family history says, yeah, we're, we're mostly lean this way or whatever. For the most part, this nation is becoming ungodly. More and more atheists are being born, if that's a good term, every day. Um, and we're not, uh, we're living hypocrisy. Most of the religious groups are beginning to recognize this. The children that are coming up are saying, that's not religion, that's hypocrisy. And they don't want anything to do with it. Some of them, are wanting to hear the truth. And hopefully that's going to happen. People will, will be able to tell them what the truth is. But that's the nation we're becoming. Um, it doesn't take much to realize that. If you just sort of scan through the papers or the headlines or the internet, you'll see. And so there are a number of people that need to hear the gospel we need to impress upon them the importance of it. And we've got to get them to come to an understanding. But it's not going to be like we talked about. It's just joining some organization. You've got good credentials. You have certain characteristics. Okay, we're going to accept you. We have to teach the truth. And to teach the truth, we have to teach the fact that we must change to come to God. We're going to have to stop what we're doing that's wrong. And a lot of people don't want to stop that. And we've got to change who we are, and we've got to become obedient to the will of God. So there are multitudes that need to hear the gospel. There are some who will not want to hear it, but we still must know and teach it. Number 10, the Bible is complete, perfect, and eternal. Now, if we believe that, if we really believe it, then we're going to make sure that we align ourselves according to what the Scriptures teach. We're going to study those things. We're going to make sure that our lives are lined up with what God wants us to do.
if we study the Bible the way that we're supposed to study the Bible, we would come to the conclusion that we are either living the way God wants us to live or we're not. And close doesn't matter. Close doesn't matter. I read the Ten Commandments, this just as an example. Let's, let's just take that as an example. And I, I'm not saying that we live under the Ten Commandments, uh, but I'm just saying as an example. If I take Ten Commandments and I am doing nine of them great, and I am doing uh, just nine out of ten, it, would that be acceptable to God? Well, you know what our argument would be? Depends on which one. Well, what if it was murder? And I did nine out of ten, but the, the tenth one was I murdered. Thou shalt not kill. Would that be okay? Is everybody okay with that? Nine out of ten is pretty good, right? You'll take nine out of ten on a test all the time. Well, we know that's just not acceptable. And so as we read God's word and we say, well, you know, my religious activity doesn't, it doesn't match up with what's in here. I, becoming a child of God, it's, that's not the way the Bible teaches. I, I've read that. I, I see it. And mine doesn't match up with that. If we were honest with ourselves and we said what we believe is not 100% what the Bible teaches. Oh, it's 90. It's 95 or, you know, it's a, it's a great percentage of what the Bible says, but it's not all of it. If we're honest, we'd have to recognize that we're not doing what God wants us to do. But that's not the world we live in. We're living in a world where close is good enough. Right? Well, we're, I'm a good person. I might attend uh, some church service three or four times a week. That doesn't mean I'm acceptable to God. What do you believe? How are you, uh, did you enter into the kingdom? How did that happen? And we'll say, well, you know, I was reading the Bible, and the Bible said in the back, said all I had to do was Pray to Jesus and uh, pray the sinner's prayer or whatever it's uh, printed in most of these Bibles that we pick up. And that's how I entered into the kingdom. That's how I was saved. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. So we have to be careful that we understand that this is God's word. If it's God's word, God cannot lie. If he's presented it to us, if he tells us what we've got to do, that's what we must comply with. And if I can't line up with that, close enough is not good enough. And we need to be careful that we understand that this is God's word. It's not just a book. And I'm bound to obey what God has said. That means I change my life to come in alignment with what the scriptures teach. And if I don't do that, that's not good enough. Oh, if we were honest truly honest in the world in which we live in. But Satan tells us that's good enough. You don't need to do that. You just be sort of religious and that's good enough for God. Now there's where the lies are. But you know we'll listen to Satan all day long but we want to get rid of the Bible. In the world in which we live in there are a lot of people who have that kind of mental thinking. All right, let's go true and false. Number one, Jesus' disciples became offended when he condemned them to hell. What did y'all get? True? Okay. <laughs> now, there's only two possible answers, right? At least that's the way I think. Too true or false? Well, you know, if you put a T and F is 
just another little leg over there, right? Um, well, I put false. And the reason I put false is I guess I was influenced by what we had studied in John 6 where he said, here's what you need to do, and they were offended by him, and they, they just they walked off. And he didn't tell them in that passage that they were going to go to hell. He told them in that passage that they were going to have to partake of his flesh and blood. And they said, oh, it's just too hard. I can't, uh, we can't, we can't hear this. So that's why I said false. Obviously, if, if, if you take that at face value, Jesus' disciples become offended when he condemns them to hell, yeah, I imagine they would be offended by that. But I based mine on John 6, and that's why I went down that road. So, true or false, you have to, you'd have to think through that one and, and figure out what you want to put. I can see... Um, Either way, I mean, I can see where, if you in general think about it, if Jesus condemned his disciples and said, well, you know, you're going to, if you continue what you're doing, you're going to wind up in hell, that would be offensive to them. It's offensive for people today, right? Um, they don't want to hear that. And when we, if we have the way or means to tell them, that they're going down the wrong path and the ultimate result's going to be hell, that's offensive to a lot of people. If you had uh, uh, an injury, let's say you uh, caught a piece of metal or, I don't know, stepped on the nail or something, and your foot doesn't react very favorably to that, and it starts turning some colors you don't think. Let's just say it's the husband that did it. The wife says, if you don't go to the doctor, you might lose that foot. Ah, no, you know, I'm not going to listen to you. Well, it's, you know, it's getting worse every day. I think you can realize that. Eh. We don't like to hear some things sometimes because that, we don't want to do what is necessary. Now, could the doctor probably clean that out, uh, give us some antibiotics or something, and make that heal up? Yeah. But if we refuse to accept it, it is the reality. The reality is you've, you've, you've injured your foot. It's not getting better. But in your stubbornness, you say, I don't want to hear what you have to say, wife. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just tough it out and see what happens. Some things we don't want to hear. How many of you have ever been told that you need to go on a diet? Did you want to hear that? Man, I don't want to hear that. But it's what we needed. And sometimes we have to tell people the reality. Look, you, you know, you're, you're believing a lie. You're following after a lie. If you don't follow what the scriptures teach, the scriptures teach that you'll be condemned in hell for eternity. People don't want to hear that, but they need to hear it. Not that we go out and throw out our chest and say, you're going to hell and I'm not. Hell is a terrible place. I get a little aggravated sometimes when my guy works in my office. He says, yeah, I'm going to hell. I know it. I know where I'm going. You don't know what hell is. And he jokes about it. Hell's not a joke. Hell's a terrible place. And it's not a place where you're going to go in, oh, the pain's too great, I'm just going to black out. No. You'll be awake. You'll be aware the whole time of what's going on. So although it's difficult to do, we must get people to understand that God's will is here. It's complete. It's perfect. It's eternal. If you want to be part of God, you must follow what's in the scriptures. 
and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. All right, number two. According to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, only a portion of the Bible is inspired. All right, I think we all get false on that one. All Scripture, he says, is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. Number three. Jesus purchased the one church with all his blood. True. True. He poured out his life blood. He died on that cross, dripping every bit of his blood. Now, maybe it didn't all come out of his body, but he gave it all. And that blood is what purchased the church. Acts twenty twenty eight. Number four, Jesus taught that God would accept divorce for any reason. It's false. We'd like for it to be true. We'd like to say, yeah, but in this circumstance, this and that, and, you know, well, there's one reason. And that's for fornication. And we say, well, we just couldn't get along, or this or that or whatever. God doesn't recognize that. Doesn't matter what man does, doesn't matter what the courts say, God only recognizes divorce for the case of fornication. Number five, according to Genesis 1 1, evolution is a viable option to the earth's existence. False. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Where did they come from? Well, they, they came from some big bang, from some big mass that was out there. And whatever happened, we, you know, we don't know, but it just sort of exploded into existence. That's the theory of the evolutionist. But the Bible teaches that God created the heavens and the earth. How did they get here? God created them. So if we want to follow after evolution, we'll believe that unproven theory that continues to be out there that people want to hold, hold, hold on to. And why do they want to do that? Because if you believe in evolution, then you don't need to believe in God, right? You don't recognize God. Who is God? God doesn't exist. Evolution is how we got here. There are so many things we could talk about evolution, but we just don't have the time. Okay. Not going to make it. So next week we'll uh, do the five questions at the bottom of the page, and we'll get on in and talking about uh, immodesty on the next lesson. Thanks for being here.